Good afternoon and welcome to all on this rather warm Ira Allen Chapel afternoon. We're delighted to have you with us and thank you once again for many of you joining us for another really terrific annual uh, humanities lecture here at the University of Vermont. Uh, this afternoon we are delighted to welcome acclaimed author, commentator, and humorist Kelvin Trilling to our great university. He hails from Kansas City, one of America's most up-and-coming mid-sized cities, and now lives in New York City. Our event today is another one of the very fruitful and ongoing relationships between the University of Vermont and the Vermont Humanities Council. Through this partnership event, we have welcomed many, many distinguished writers and celebrity authors to our campus. And tonight we have another luminary among us that we will have the pleasure of hearing from. In a moment, Unite Human uh, the UVM Humanities Center co-director Luis Branco will formally introduce our distinguished guests. But before that formal introduction, um, I wanted to mention again that tonight's event is the kickoff for the Vermont Humanities Center popular First Wednesdays lecture series, which takes place throughout the fall and winter in our libraries throughout the state of Vermont. And I also want to publicly thank the executive director of the Vermont Humanities Center, a dear friend, a wonderful colleague, Peter Gilbert, who's with us tonight. Peter. <laughs> And very importantly, I also want to underscore this relationship between our university's Humanities Center, a very important part of the core of our university, and the relationship with the Vermont Humanities Council. A number of First Wednesday's talks this year are being led by faculty from the UVM, and it is because of their passionate and great interest and insight into the humanities, and because of the generosity of Peter Gilbert and our friends at the Vermont Humanities Council as well. Our wider Vermont community is the beneficiary, quite frankly, of this fruitful, wonderful relationship between the University's Humanities Center and the Vermont Humanities Council. And we hope that it continues to thrive for many decades to come, Peter. We look forward to that very important partnership between these two venerable Vermont institutions. And now I would like to invite my colleague, Luis, to join us, the co-director of the University of Vermont's Humanities Center, who will introduce our very distinguished guests this evening. Thank you all for being with us. Luis. Thank you. Thank you, President Sullivan. And uh, I want to extend a, a warm welcome and a Happy hot afternoon to all of you of my own, and um, what a pleasure it is to have Calvin Trillin with us today. Uh, I do want to just take a moment and, and comment on what Profe uh, President Sullivan was just saying about the Vermont Humanities Council. This is a tremendous organization that we have here in the state of Vermont. Uh, the First Wednesdays program is really a stellar statewide public humanities effort and the staff of the Humanities Council do a fantastic job putting it all together. Um, it's also underwritten by some very important organizations, uh, the Alma Gibbs Doncian Fo uh, Foundation, the Vermont Department of Libraries, the National Life Group Foundation, um, and we would normally be at the Brownell Library in Essex Junction. That's where we have our first Wednesdays programs in this area. But you'll notice two things. We're not yet in October, which is when it usually begins. Uh, and you'll notice this is a large crowd. Apparently, uh, there's a lot of people who have not quite had enough of Calvin Trillin in our area. And we would totally overwhelm that space. So that's why we're here. Um, so Mr. Trillin is going to be taking questions uh, after the talk. You'll find that there are some uh, blank uh, cards. So if you have a question, 
grab a pencil and a card and send it to the aisles. And then at the end of the talk, I will collect those. And, uh, and um, as he said, don't ask him any questions that insult him. So I'll be filtering that. Uh, so let me say some words about Calvin Trillin. Uh, we know he's from Kansas City. We know he's a longtime New Yorker. But do you know he's been spending his summers in Nova Scotia for a very long time? I didn't know that until a few weeks ago. Uh, he's been described as a classic American humorist. After graduating from Yale, uh, he spent some time in the Army uh, and then began a career writing at Time Magazine based in Atlanta covering the civil rights struggles. Uh, after about a year, he was moved to New York uh, and probably to the chagrin of Time Magazine, uh, moved over to the New Yorker in 1963 and since then has published over 300 essays in The New Yorker. Uh, his series, U.S. Journal, which ran between 1967 and 1982, is really one of that magazine's magnificent projects, uh, in which Calvin was tasked with traveling to different corners of the United States to report on the doings there. The subjects of that series ranged from the murder of a farmer's wife in Iowa, to an effort to write the definitive history of a Louisiana restaurant called Diddy's, or as he wrote at the time, to eat an awful lot of baked duck and dirty rice trying. Some of the murder stories from that series uh, were published in 1984 as the book Killings, and, which was described in one review as that rarity, reportage as art. It was just republished this year in case you're interested, with new material. For a number of years, he's been a columnist and worked as a deadline poet, writing political poetry and verse for the nation. And for a time, he found his way back to Time Magazine as a columnist. These columns, poems, and writings have been compiled into five books. And one of them, quite enough of Calvin Trillin, was awarded with a Thurber Prize for American humor in 2011. He's been involved in theater, performing some of his work on stage, including at the American Place Theater, which generated one review that declared him to be the Buster Keaton of performance humorists. And those of you who are attentive readers of The New Yorker now would also know that he's been a screenwriter for some family movies with some unusually complex plots and deep characters in productions that have spanned several generations of Trillin uh, family members, but reviews of that body of work uh, have been a lot more tempered, apparently. All told, he's published over 20 books written across a diverse array of genres. Memoir, short stories, travelogue, political poetry, commentary, do I dare say food ethnography? On too many topics for me to recount here. It seems that even if, as he says, a book's life, a shelf life is somewhere between milk and yogurt, his books very quickly find their way to the bestseller list before they spoil. So if there's anybody who might have some insights into the writing life, it's this man. Calvin Trillin, I want to welcome you to the University of Vermont. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, it's, it's true that the shelf life is somewhere between milk and yogurt. Uh, some writers like Danielle Steele and Dan Brown have a longer shelf life, but those books contain preservatives. Uh, it's nice to be back in New York. I flew up this morning from New York. Um, I'm l less concerned about airport security than a lot of people because remember the shoe bomber several years ago? Um, the shoe bomber, I decided, was part of a prank. Um, you remember the shoe bomber as someone who was described as very suggestible. 
uh, and not very competent. And he practically had the flight attendant light a match to his uh, shoes to carry out his mission. Um, and what I realized was that there was one Arab terrorist with a sense of humor, Khalid the Droll, and he said, I bet I can make them all take their shoes off in airports. <laughs> so he recruited this bozo, and he, uh, he, he set him up for the, for the shoe bomber. Um, and I wrote about this, and I said, you'll know if I, that I'm right if, uh, if the next uh, caught terrorist uh, is called, because of his MO, the underwear bomber. Uh, and as a matter of fact, there was an underwear bomber. And I talked about that on television once, and um, the interview was shown to my seven-year-old grandson, and he said, Babo said underwear on television. Uh, um, I was talking about writing as sort of an occupation, which is, it's not a profit center. Um, ordinarily, um, you don't get too much for a book. Uh, I tried to get a New York ordinance through that the advance for a book had to be larger than the check at the lunch at which it was discussed. Uh, <laughs> But the publisher said that was unrealistic, and that they would move to New Jersey if that origin came on. I knew they wouldn't move to New Jersey because there's no good place to have lunch in New Jersey. Um, the sort of highest form of writing, I think everybody agrees, is poetry. And uh, at least when I started doing verse, uh, the highest payer of, of anybody was the New Yorker, and they paid $10 a line. Uh, for poetry. Um, so if you do the math, uh, you can understand why there's not a huge crowd in front of the poetry booth at the career day fair. Um, $10 a line is not, not so much. Uh, also, satire is paid very badly. Uh, years ago, I wrote for a doomed magazine of political satire called Monocle. Um, and um, their, their pay scale was so low that for one piece I sent in, they sent me a bill. Uh, uh, I, what I've done mostly in my time is uh, journalism, um, which I learned on the college paper. I learned objectivity, which is we try to be equally inaccurate about both sides. Uh, and as you heard from Luis, I started out at Time. I worked in the South as a reporter. It was a kind of a group journalism uh, system then. And the Time was divided up uh, uh, into sections. Uh, and I was what was called a floater for a time. That is, I moved from section to section. Uh, so when the religion writer, who knew quite a bit about religion, went on vacation, I would come from show business and write with just as much authority as he had. Um, I tried to get out of the religion section by writing alleged in front of any historical religious event that I thought was at all questionable, like the alleged parting of the Red Sea, the alleged crucifixion. Um, and, th and then, as you heard, I moved, I moved to uh, the New Yorker in 1963 so I've been there all, all, longer than almost anybody, uh, I, except for Roger Angel and, uh, I mean, among writers, uh, Roger Angel and Calvin Tompkins. Uh, our names are so close that I'm often credited with Calvin Tompkins' stories, and I just try to look modest and shrug. Uh, but I've been there so long that when people have a complaint about the New Yorker, they sometimes write me. And the first time uh, the New Yorker had a photograph of an uh, actress with bare breasts, I got some mail saying how shocking it was that this magazine, always known for its elegant, understated prose, would 
publish such a picture. And um, uh, my only defense was they were small breasts. Uh, so you might say the understatement is still there. Uh, but as you heard from Luis, I have concentrated on America. Um, uh, I spent 15 years every three weeks going somewhere, and at the same time, there was a reporter for the AP named Jules Lowe who had a similar series. So we formed something called the American Association of American Correspondents Covering America. Uh, our acronym was GLINGPAC. We just liked the way that sounded. And there were only two of us in the organization. And uh, we met at O'Hare Airport, uh, where we spent most of our time changing planes. And uh, we only had one rule. And the rule was, you can't quote de Tocqueville. Uh, that's how we kept the membership down. Um, I concentrated on America partly because uh, I'm very bad at languages, despite a summer at Middlebury uh, studying Spanish. Uh, I've often described my attack on the Spanish language as looking like one of those drug raids you see with a battering ram. Uh, and the t law enforcement officials who have the, those windbreakers on that say FBI or DEA, mine says, yo hablo espanol. Uh, uh, I've, had, I've had terrible experience with language. Um, uh, I, I tried to uh, talk some people into uh, helping me read the wall signs on Chinese restaurants. Uh, and finally, somebody gave me a little card that says in Chinese, I'd like some of what the people at the next table are having, uh, which I carried for a while. Uh, I knew a food and wine writer named Finnegan who um, went to Tokyo to do some stories and took the trouble to learn enough Japanese to get around in restaurants. And um, he was better at language than I am. And um, he was in Tokyo and at a restaurant and he saw something that looked absolutely marvelous at the next table and he called the waiter over and said, uh, could I have some of what the, the man at the next table is eating? The waiter looked sh puzzled. Then he uh, walked over to the man, picked up his plate, <laughs> brought it to Finnegan. Uh, but uh, I've never been able to do that. Uh, I speak a little French, but I don't do verbs. I, I find that's what can ruin your vacation, is verbs. Um, I used to do verbs like, I even did what we would call at home fancy uh, Sunday go to meeting verbs like, où se trouve la plage? Uh, where does it find itself? The beach. But I even gave that up. The beach knows where it is. Um, so I think when, when I try to imagine my obituary, and reporters get usually a pretty decent obituary, sort of professional courtesy. Um, I think of the subhead being monolingual reporter succumbs. Uh, um, the other reason um, I went around the country more than concentrate on Washington is that a lot of the Washington uh, reporting has to do with economics. And um, I'm not good at economics. And um, uh, partly because of math. Math was my worst subject. I, I was never able to persuade the mathematics teacher that many of my answers were meant ironically. Uh, and I had trouble with pi, as the pi r square kind of pi. Uh, I read somewhere that some years ago the Texas State Legislature passed a resolution changing pi to an even three. Uh, and I was for it. I thought it sounded, sounded good to me. So I've never read much, uh, written much about economics, except uh, when, when George Bush said that Ronald Reagan was preaching voodoo economics, uh, I tried to imagine meeting a couple that had just come back from the Caribbean, and they had seen a voodoo economics ceremony uh, with a lot of chanting, voodoo, voodoo, 
trickle, 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 and the, the acrid smell of the books being cooked. Um, but that's about all I've ever done on voodoo, on, on economics. Well, no, that's not true. During the Clinton administration, when Clinton said they were going to concentrate laser-like on the, uh, on the economy, and I thought, well, I don't know anything about the economy, so I thought I'd get in a sort of a preemptive strike. So I wrote, the question is, what's going to happen when the def deficit reduction component begins to bite? This was in his first budget that Clinton uh, put out that passed by one vote in the Congress. Uh, I don't know what that means, what's going to happen when the deficit reduction component begins to bite, but it's, I sounded good. A component always adds a little gravitas to anything you say, I think. Um, and um, around the same time, I started a column for The Nation. Um, and oddly enough, The Nation had the same editor as, the Mo as Monocle, the same person who had sent me a bill for a piece, the wily and parsimonious Victor S. Navasky. And so when he asked me if I wanted to do a column for The Nation, I said, well, I know the talk of money causes you to break out in a rash, but how much were you thinking of paying for each one of these columns? And he said, something in the high two figures. And, <laughs> and I said, how much is that? And he said, well, we've been paying 65. I said, that sounds like the middle two figures uh, to me. So I turned it over to my high-powered agent and said, play hardball. And he got him up to 100. Um, so a, a few weeks after I started doing the column, Navasky came to me and said, what about these quotes? And I said, uh, what quotes are those? And he said, did John Foster Dulles really say, you can't fool all the people all the time, but you might as well give it your best shot? I said, Victor, at these rates, you can't expect real quotes. Uh, 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 I'm sometimes asked when it comes to the columns and, and the poetry uh, if I'm ashamed to be making a living by making snide, underhanded remarks about respectable public servants. And my only defense there is it's not much of a living. Uh, uh, and I'm also asked whether politicians get angry. Uh, and not, they wouldn't really admit that they had read one of my columns, I think. Um, and, and it's hard to reply to something like, say, one of my poems about Mitt Romney uh, during that, that campaign, which was, um, yes, Mitt's so smooth of speech and smooth of garb, he reminds us all of Ken, of Ken and Barbie, so quick to shed his moderate regalia, he may, like Ken, be lacking genitalia. Uh, well, the, his press guy is not going to write saying the governor actually has genitalia. Uh, uh, so uh, they don't really get mad much. Uh, I, I get a lot of uh, anger from uh, animal people. Uh, by animal people, I don't mean people who were as babies thrown clear in, a, in an airplane crash in Africa and raised by orangutans. Uh, I mean people with a particular concern for animals. Uh, I wrote a column once, when, when I, as you heard, I live in Canada in the summer. Um, you get a lot of facts on CBC. Uh, I come home around Labor Day, I usually have enough facts to last me till February or March from CBC. One of the facts I heard on CBC was that a hummingbird, hummingbird weighs as much as a quarter. And it makes you think, I thought, well, does it weigh as much as two dimes and a nickel? Uh, and then I thought, well, how would you go about weighing a hummingbird? Because they're always in flight. And then, and then I wrote, well, We've all seen those nature documentaries where they stun a wildebeest with a stun dart and they put a little thing on his ear and they set him loose. Do the same thing with hummingbirds. 
The, the hard thing's not hitting them with those little bitty darts. The hard thing is slapping them on the cheeks to bring them around. A lot of hummingbird people didn't like that column. I once mentioned corgis. I described them as a dog that seems to have been assembled from parts of other breeds of dogs and not the parts that those other breeds were all that sorry about giving up. Uh, be surprised how many corgi eaters there are, corgi owners there are in New York. Um, also, I don't see uh, politicians in New York. They mainly hang around Washington, and I, I try not to go to Washington too often. Um, I did about 20 years ago, I started to have these awful daydreams that th I met politicians in New York. I see myself showing up to a dinner party, and I'm one of the first people there. Uh, the, the host is not even back from the office yet, and the only other guest is Steve Forbes. Remember Steve Forbes? And um, I'm trying to make conversation, and I say, I guess you're wondering why I kept referring to you during the campaign as a dork robot. Uh, and then just then Al Gore walks in, and he's got these kind of natural shades of kind of thing, and uh, he starts complaining about what I've said about him, and, and, I, uh, and I said, he doesn't like the fact that I once referred to him as a man-like object. Uh, uh, and then Alphonse D'Amato comes, um, and he was the senator from New York at the time, um, and uh, he, he's mad because I referred to him. I said, well, tomato, uh, tomato is a very hard rhyme. It rhymes with tomato, uh, but I'm from Kansas City and I can't bring myself to say tomato. Uh, it does happen to rhyme with sleazeball obligato. Uh, um, and then here comes Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger looks very angry. And I said, could it be that little war criminal comment that I made? Talk about hypersensitive. Uh, but that's not what's bothering him. What's bothering him is I wondered in one column, why is it that George Schultz, a former Republican Secretary of State with a PhD, is always called Mr. Schultz, and Henry Kissinger, a former Republican Secretary of State with a PhD, is called Dr. Kissinger? And the only thing I could figure is maybe Kissinger as a podiatry practice on the side. Uh, uh, the, at one point, I quit writing the column uh, for the nation, and um, I wrote a poem. It was about John Sununu. Um, not the younger John Sununu, but the John Sununu who was in George H.W. Bush's cabinet. And, um, sort of stuck out in the cabinet. Uh, he wasn't even shaped like the other cabinet members. And um, he uh, also, he had, Sununu had that quality that attracts the attention of people like me, which is that he always had to prove that he was the smartest guy in the room. Um, so I, uh, I wrote a poem called, If You Knew What Sununu. Uh, um, and, I sent it to the nation, and, and uh, the wily and parsimonious Victor S. Navasky said uh, he'd like to run that poem. Uh, and I said, I'd, I'd like for you to write one on every issue. Um, it's not every week, because as I pointed out, uh, the nation comes out only every other week in the summer, even though the downtrodden are oppressed every day of the year. Uh, but he wanted me to do one every issue. And I said, well, how much were you thinking of paying? And he said, even though it's shorter than the column, we'll pay you $100 a poem. Well, um, I didn't think about it, uh, think much of it at the beginning, but then I realized that if the New Yorker paid $10 a line, and that was the top pay for poets, if I wrote a two-line poem, I would be getting $50 a line uh, and be the highest paid poet in the country. Uh, and uh, so anytime, so I agreed to do it. And anytime I wanted to get the buzz you get 
for working at the absolute top dollar in your field, I would write a two-line poem. Um, when Lloyd Benson, the senator from Texas who had made the Secretary of Treasury, um, I wrote a poem uh, that was, the man is known for quo pro quidness. In Texas, that's, that's how folks do business. Uh, that's $50 a line. And I wrote one about George W. Bush when his college transcript was revealed during the campaign to no apparent effect. Obliviously on he sails with marks not quite as good as quails. Uh, so that, and I started to write shorter and shorter poetry. I think I've written one of the shortest poems ever written. Um, uh, the title, and that, that doesn't count in the length. The title was something like the political, societal, and philosophical implication of the O.J. Simpson trial. And the poem was, O.J., oy vey. Um, and because of, of writing this verse for the nation, my politics have changed. I'm now basically in favor of people whose names rhyme easily. Uh, I mean, my candidates were people like Ross Perot, uh, John McCain, uh, uh, not the Clintons. The Clintons, the Clintons, the, the, the Clinton is the orange of American presidents. It doesn't rhyme with anything. Uh, do you remember when during the unpleasantness uh, during the Clinton administration when Hillary sort of took the lead, she went on the uh, Today program. Um, I wrote a poem about it, and so I tried to use, I used her, what we used to call a maiden name. I don't think we use that term anymore, or a name of origin, or slave name, whatever you call it. Um, uh, and so it's up to our Miss Rodham to prove that Bill's White House isn't Sodom. It's left to this adroit senora to show that it is just Gomorrah. Um, Bush, uh, I actually tried to be nice to people when they left. Um, Bush is a bad name uh, to rhyme, but when George H.W. left, I said in a poem, farewell to you, um, George Herbert Walker, though never treasured as a talker, your predicates were often prone to wander nounless off alone. You did your best in your own way, the way of Greenwich Country Day. So just relax and take your ease and never order Japanese. Uh, uh, I've also uh, written some memoir, and um, I'm, I'm in a terrible dis disadvantage writing memoir because, and I, I wouldn't say this in New York, and I'm sure this won't go back to New York, because um, it would be damaging to my reputation. Um, I had a happy childhood. Um, and this is a terrible disadvantage in memoir writing in America now because, because memoir writing is sort of an arms race, an atrocity race, that you have to have some hideous secret, some glue-sniffing grandma or something like that, or some incest or bestiality or incestuous bestiality. And uh, I didn't really have that. I went to a literary uh, conference in Key West once, what I call the January Dip in Airfares Literary Conference. And they always had a theme, and the theme was memoir. And I, I saw myself hanging out in some memoirist hangout late at night with a bunch of memoirists, and they're all talking about their secrets that they've exposed. And they say, did you have a horrible secret in your childhood? The only secret I could think of had to do with my collie dog, Chubby. Um, we had a collie dog when I was maybe three or four, and my sister, Suki the Oppressor, uh, was maybe five. Uh, and he was sickly, the Chubby, and suddenly he disappeared. And we went to our parents and we said, where's Chubby? And they said, Chubby was sickly, and, and so we gave him to some friends who have a farm. And that way he'll get, it'll be out in the sunshine, 
in the farmyard, frolicking with the other animals. And I never gave it much thought. And then finally, Chubby's name came up when we were all having dinner. I think I was back from college. And I said, why don't we ever go visit Chubby on the farm? And Suki said, there wasn't any farm, you dummy. Chubby had to be put down. And I said, Chubby's gone? And my mother said, Collies didn't usually live 18 or 20 years anyway. Uh, he'd be gone in any case. And I said, yeah, but why am I just finding out now? And my father said, it's not our fault you're slow on the uptake. And I wrote that somewhere, and about a week later, I got a call from Suki. She said, the collie was not called Chubby. The collie was called George. She said, you were called Chubby. <laughs> I, um, I, I've written a, some about my family, and I was asked on a book tour, aren't you worried that someday your daughters will write about you? And I said, no, I'm not worried at all because when they were five and eight, I had them sign a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> the little one really couldn't write, but I said, just put an X there. And nothing elaborate, the same one Buckingham Palace uses for the servants, I think. Um, and I've done some, some novels. Um, I wrote a novel about working at a news magazine, and, and that's the one where I admitted that trying to get out of the religion section, I was the writer who wrote alleged in front of any religious event that I thought was all questionable. Um, and then I wrote a parking novel and uh, called Tepper Isn't Going Out. Um, I'm not here to boast, but we think it's the first parking novel ever written. Uh, it's about a man who stays in his spot, legal spot, and doesn't move. Um, and there was a mayor in it named Ducavelli, who was a showboating, vindictive, nasty mayor with an Italian name, and some people thought it was a disrespectful uh, jibe at Mayor Giuliani, who was then the mayor. And uh, my, my defense on that one was uh, I actually uh, thought Giuliani behaved pretty well at 9-11, said that sometimes a paranoid control freak is just what the occasion calls for. Um, I thought I'd end by, by uh, reading a column that has to do with, with journalism and writing. And it's called Corrections. Um, and uh, it requires reading glasses. Um, January, 9, January 14th, because of an editing error on an article in Friday's theater section, transposed the identifications of two people involved in the production of Waiting for Bruce, a farce now in rehearsal at the Rivoli. Ralph W. Murtaugh Jr., a New York attorney, is one of the play's financial backers. Hillary Murtaugh plays the ingenue. The two Murtaughs are not related. At no time during the rehearsal visited by the reporter did Ralph Murtaugh, Jr., sashay across the stage. March 25th, because of some problems in transmission, there were several errors in yesterday's account of a symposium held by the Women's Civic Forum of Rye on the role played by slovenliness in cases of domestic violence. The moderator of the symposium, Laura Murtaugh, should not have been identified as an unmarried mother of eight. Mrs. Murtaugh, the president of the, of the Women's Civic Forum, is married to Ralph W. Murtaugh, Jr., an attorney who practices in Manhattan. The phrase, he was raised with the hogs and he lived like a hog, was wed by Mrs. Murtaugh from the trial testimony of an Ohio woman. It did not refer to Mrs. Murtaugh's own husband. Mr. Murtaugh was raised in New York. An article in yesterday's edition on the growing contention between lawyers and their clients 
should not have used an anonymous quotation referring to the firm of Newton, Murtaugh, and Clayton as ambulance chasing jackals without offering the firm an opportunity to reply. Also, the number of hours customarily billed by Newton Murtaugh partners was shown incorrectly on a chart accompanying the article. According to a spokesman for the firm, the partner who said he bills clients for 35 or 40 hours on a good day was speaking ironically. There are only 24 hours in a day. The same article is an error as to the first name and background of one of the firm's senior partners. The correct name is Ralph W. Murtaugh, Jr. There is no one named Hillary Murtaugh connected with the firm. Ralph W. Murtaugh has at no time played an ingenue on Broadway. <laughs> April 29th, because of a computer error, the early editions on Wednesday misidentified the person arrested for a series of armed robberies of kitchen supply stores on the west side of Manhattan, the so-called Pesto Bandit. The person arrested was Raymond Cullum, 22, of Queens. Ralph W. Murtaugh III, 19, of Rye, should have been identified as the runner-up in the annual Squash for Kids charity squash tournament in Rye, rather than as the alleged robber. May 18th, because of an error in transmission, a four-bedroom brick colonial house on Weeping Ben Lane in Rye, owned by Mr. and Mrs. Ralph W. Murtaugh, Jr., was incorrectly listed in Sunday's real estate section as being on the market for $17,500. The home is not for sale. In Sunday's edition, the account of a wedding that took place the previous day at St. John's Church in Rye was incorrect in a number of respects. The cause of the error was the participa participation of the reporter in the reception. This is in itself against the policy of this newspaper and should not have occurred. Jane Murtaugh was misidentified in two mentions. She was neither the mother of the bride nor the father of the bride. She was the bride. It was she who was wearing a white silk gown trimmed in tulle. The minister was wearing conventional ministerial robes. Ms. Murtaugh should not have been identified on second mention as Mrs. Perkins, since she will retain her name and since Mr. Perkins was not, in fact, the groom. The number of bridesmaids was incorrectly reported. There were eight bridesmaids, not 38. Their dresses were blue, not glued. The bridegroom's name is not Franklin Marshall. His name is Emery Barnswell, and he graduated from Franklin and Marshall College. Mr. Barnswell never attended Emory University, which in any case does not offer a degree in furniture stripping. Mr. Barnswell's ancestor was not a signer of the Declaration of Independence and was not named Hector Boom Boom Bondini. The name of the father of the bride was inadvertently dropped from the article. He is Hillary Murtaugh. Thank you. Well, I hope you have questions. Did you write them down? We'll have some folks uh, collect them. In the meantime, I have the mic, and so I get to ask some questions. So um, I'm curious if there are any particular writers who, who, who you really delight in, who you look forward to the next thing that they're going to, to write, that you, you in some way sort of say, wow, this, this takes me someplace else that my own writing just doesn't take me. Are, are, mm -hmm. are there writers out there that really inspire you right now? Um, yeah, but I'm, I'm not sure that it's, it's a matter of one or two. I mean, I think, I think a lot of writers, um, I think there, there happen to be a lot of, of uh, good humorists working now. Um, uh, Garrison Keillor, uh, David Sedaris, um, and, um, uh, and good nonfiction writers, John McPhee, uh, um, uh, and, and, and certainly a lot of novelists, uh, and, and I, uh, the, and there's some novels whose work I've always read, I mean like, if, 
I read a Philip Roth book, even if it's not his best book, simply because he wrote the book. Um, there's some, some novelists like that. And do you and Billy Collins ever sit down together and, and trade verse? Uh, no, I know Billy Collins. I met him at the January Dip in Airfares Literary Conference, I think, originally. We were there for a week. Um, he's a very popular uh, poet, and I told him it was difficult to have lunch with him because there was always a swath of poetesses behind him. Um, not, not female poets, but poetesses, which I think of as a certain long dress and floppy hats. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but he, he, yeah, he's entertaining, and, he, and he's very accessible, which is, I think, to certain people, uh, a curse, but, but appreciated by me. Uh, go ahead. So, uh, so here's a question. Uh, if you were to write a two-line poem about Trump, what would it be? Or have you done it? I think I've done it, but I, I actually meant to bring some, but I didn't bring it. I remember once uh, saying, I, I can't get the exact meter or rhyme, but, but uh, it's uh, to feel better about having, as a leader, this phony, remember, uh, Italians survive Berlusconi. I was trying to be encouraging to people. I'm not sure that I feel very encouraged. <laughs> if writing isn't much of a living, how have you survived in New York City? Well, I, 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 I'd like to say, no, writing, writing humor is not much of a living. Uh, <laughs> writing nonfiction for the New Yorker is perfectly reasonable. Really. Also, I was talking to somebody last night about this. Uh, so much of your life depends on w the year you were born. I don't mean that in an, in an astrological way. I, I mean, uh, I, we, uh, we've got a brownstone in the village. Um, in 1969, uh, uh, and um, so I now live on a block that I couldn't afford to live on. Uh, so it sort of depends on whether you hit the market right by chance. Uh, so, but I, I don't want to complain. The New Yorker, I think, has always tried to pay writers a reasonable amount. I think we have a historian in the crowd. How did you develop your legendarily rigorous methodology as a historian? I wish I had a ri rigid methodology. Uh, I was just saying to somebody today, uh, John McPhee has a book out about writing and, and so essays that have been in The New Yorker and and after I read one of them, I said, Dan McPhee actually knows what he's doing. Uh, it's very irritating, because most of us uh, who have to just muddle through don't know what we're doing until we do it, and often not even then. Um, so he, he has a rigid way of writing, but, but uh, I just sort of fumble along. <laughs> uh, do you have uh, any thoughts to share about the challenges facing journalism today? I'm sorry, the what? The challenges facing journalism today? Well, and there, there's nobody who knows less about this than a, than a reporter. Um, but I just read, for instance, by chance today, the only freestanding book review section left in the country is at the New York Times. Uh, uh, they're, they're I, I think newspapers and, and I'm afraid magazines are sort of going the way of, um, of the dodo bird. And, um, and there, are other, there are other outlets, of course, uh, and I, it's hard to predict how what they are. Particularly, my daughters call me net boy, but I think they mean it ironically. Uh, I'm not very good at, at computers, and so I can't imagine, but sometimes, I, I got off the subway not long ago, and uh, a gentleman, as we got to the top of the stairs, said to me, and he was about my age, that we were the only people reading newspapers on the subway. Everybody else was looking at a cell phone. Um, and um, I guess that's going to sort itself out, but I, but, 
I, I'm certainly not an expert on it. So, are you still a happy eater? Yeah, and I'm not sure I eat as much as I used to eat. Um, I am a happy eater. I, 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 uh, writing about food or eating started out as a sort of way during those 15 years of going around the country to get some comic relief, not so much for the readers, but for myself from doing stories about murders and controversies and everything. And, um, and then it, it turned into sort of a sideline. Uh, but I've never known anything about food. I mean, I don't, I, I don't really cook, and I, um, I wouldn't know a proper beef wellington from a non-proper, unproper beef wellington. Um, and, and so I really have written about food as a way of making jokes and, and writing about other things. Uh, but that doesn't keep people from uh, asking me expert advice. I think, it, I think I'm a lesson in how easy it is to become an expert in this country, <laughs> since I keep saying I don't know anything about it, and it doesn't do any good. Well, actually, there are some questions asking for advice. Um, right. uh, uh, what great meals do, do you have in New Brunswick? In New Brunswick? Oh, Nova Scotia. Yeah. Uh, New Brunswick is another province. I know you knew that, uh, Luis, but uh, we Canadians often complain about Americans not knowing much about Canada. Remember that there was a guy named Rick Mercer, I guess he still is, who used to go around uh, the United States asking him questions like, uh, would you sign a petition to, to uh, try to get Canadians to stop their habit of putting the sick and elderly out on ice floes? And, or, 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 or do you think that Canada, which has a 20-hour day, should shift to a 24-hour day, make it easier. 20, hour, 20 hours with, of course, longer hours. Um, and uh, well, we have to. I, that's the only place I cook is in Nova Scotia. I wrote a piece about it. I have either three dishes or eight dishes, depending on how you count. Uh, for instance, whether whether stove involvement has to be there uh, to make a dish. Uh, for instance, my famous smoked mackerel pate is, uh, well, I might as well give you away the secret now, the secret ingredient is smoked mackerel <laughs> in the Cuisinart. Uh, little lemon to hold together. On, on birthdays and national holidays, like Canada Day, I put a little mayonnaise in it. That's one of my typical recipes. That's about all I'm up to. So, uh, so some, some folks are looking for information on what you know about food here in Vermont. Uh, so the one question is, uh, ha since you just wrote a thing about Texas barbecue, what do you know about Vermont barbecue? I wasn't aware that there was a Vermont Harvard uh, 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 um, well, Barbecue is an interesting subject. I, I, uh, I once went to a uh, Southern, Re Southern Food Alliance uh, event uh, uh, to uh, give a speech, and, it, and, and their theme was barbecue. And, they had a speech on the politics of barbecue and the sociology, and, 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 and it, it, it's quite interesting. And, and uh, one woman, uh, Marcia Cohn Ferris, uh, uh, gave a uh, speech about, she was raised Jewish in Arkansas. It was called, We Didn't Know From Fatback, and it was about uh, what, what uh, Jews did about barbecue. But she didn't know about what I call the barbecue easement. The barbecue easement was granted by the, by the great rabbi of uh, Joplin, Missouri, um, who was a noted Talmudist and pit master. <laughs> and he said that any animal, um, any farm animal uh, without, without uh, gills, 
subjected to more than four hours of heat uh, is kosher. <laughs> it's called the barbecue easement. You'll find it in some of the more obscure Talmudic studies. Well, President Sullivan, maybe we need to start an institute of barbecue studies up here, and he'll be our first uh, director. Uh, so, so speaking of colleges and universities, someone asked, what colleges or universities would you recommend a young poet or a writer seek out and, uh, and attend? Well, that's a good question. I, I, uh, I, Princeton now, of course, has, has a number of well-known writers on the faculty and, I, and who actually teach, uh, unlike some sort of of the kind of left-handed uh, on the faculty, not exactly teaching. But Fee has taught there for years. Joyce Carol Oates is there. Tony Morrison was there. Uh, so uh, I, I took a, a course at Yale called Daily Themes, which was uh, which required. Uh, the, it was called themes, but there was fiction, little vignettes, one-page vignette. Uh, every day, you had to have a, a one-page uh, vignette in the professor's mailbox every morning, uh, every weekday morning, and and uh, Yale was then on a grading system of numbers, but they used letters uh, A, B, C, D, W, and nobody knew officially what W meant, but most people thought it meant worthless. Uh, Got, and people got a lot of worthless. Uh, and of course, it turned out the, the first week you'd think, well, this isn't so hard. Um, and then you realize the second week, you pretty much used up your life experience. Uh, uh, and um, it was, the, I talked, I later did a piece on it. Uh, uh, and called something like no telling, no summing up. And the, um, I interviewed one of the professors who, he said he thought he had read more scenes of boys and girls breaking up than any person in the history of the English language. Uh, he knew about walking away in the rain and throwing dishes and all this stuff. Uh, anyway, I think all, now, I, I think the, the, the sort of more traditional English departments always had a suspicion of teaching writing. Um, uh, and so I, I think it took a long time for a place like Yale to, to um, have writing uh, as, as a course. Uh, some folks want to hear stories from the New Yorker. So, uh, uh, what? so who were your favorite colleagues and writers at the New Yorker over the years? Um, got any great stories from uh, some of those? Uh, great years? water fountain stuff? Uh, well, I don't know. Uh, the, I, I went to the New Yorker in 1963, and pretty much nothing happened for about 20 years. Uh, uh, I mean, literally, there was no... Uh, and then uh, right around the time of the, I guess it was the 50th anniversary, 75, um, there... Um, uh, there was a lot of t turmoil, and then there was turmoil over over who would become editor, and and uh, uh, but I I used to get when I first got there, they had a very weird way of of paying you. Um, we had drawing accounts, which were sort of like advances against earnings, and then when you did a piece, you'd get a little chit giving you credit, and then sometimes there were mysterious things like. We used to get these little chits that said breakage, and they would give me money for breakage. And I, had, I never have found out what that meant. I thought, if I'm breaking something, I should pay. Uh, <laughs> but they're paying me. I, I always said that the finances, the New Yorker, um, uh, were, were taken, were, were all handled on the 20th floor in a secret room full of female Jesuits with quill pens uh, who worked all night and then we got a thing. But it, I think the New Yorker is more, I, for want of a better word, regularized now. 
Uh, it used to be sort of a quirky beast. Uh, now I think it's more run more like other places. Last question. I'm going <clears> to <throat> slightly modify it <clears throat> from how it was framed here, but when will subtlety and humor return to our land? Well, I think so, I think there's there's still subtlety and, and humor. It just doesn't happen to be in the White House. Um, <laughs> And, and the, um, uh, I, I'm not so sure that, that it varies from era to era. I mean, people talk about the golden age of, uh, of uh, Benchley and E.B. White and, and uh, Perelman, and then, and then you look at it and there, there are only five people. That were, when we, and uh, I think they're, they're, all, they're never, more than a fairly small group of people writing particularly uh, uh, short humor. Uh, and, and, um, and it doesn't mean that it's brain surgery. It just means that few people have that little funny quirk in their heads. Uh, and I'm not sure it's less now than it, than it, than it was before. Uh, and and although the opportunity that now people get out of Harvard and go to Hollywood hoping to be television writers. So there, there's a lot of different opportunities and, and they don't have to say it's not much of a living. Uh, so I, I think that's one of the changes. Well, thank you very much, Calvin Trillin. And thank you all.